Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. One thing before we start the show. I want to let you know about a special interview you'll hear at the end of this episode. It's with the host of a brand new podcast called Art Architects, the architects of art. The cool thing is this show is hosted by Director X and Taj Critchlow, two of the biggest music video directors on the planet. These guys are responsible for game-changing videos from artists like Drake and Coldplay and Kendrick Lamar and so many more. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. I sure did. That's coming up at the end of this episode. All right, let's get on with things. Long before I started doing this for a living, I had the notion that I was going to be a record producer. I mean, after all, I loved music, and the idea of being able to help record it would be a great job. So as high school wound down, I started to look around for schools that taught music production. And that's when reality set in. All of them asked for a portfolio of past work. I I was 18 years old from a small prairie town. How was I supposed to have a portfolio of past work? They also made it very clear that I had to be musically adept. I was a pretty good drummer, but that wasn't enough. I had seven years of accordion lessons, but that didn't seem to cut it. I couldn't play guitar or any type of keyboard. So, long story short, I gave up that dream after a few rejection letters, and here we are. But I'm still fascinated by the talent and equipment that goes into making records, which is why anytime I get a chance to talk to someone who does this for a living, who does record production, I'm in. David Bottrell is one of those guys. He's a Canadian producer who has worked with Tool and Muse and Peter Gabriel and the Smashing Pumpkins and Rush and a ton of others. He's got three Grammys, and he's worked in some of the most famous recording studios from here to the UK. And I've got a chance to talk to him about being a record producer? You bet. Let's go. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Hi again, I'm Alan Cross, and this is another episode that you can file under the heading Studio Stories. It's a chat with David Bottrell, the Canadian guy who has been involved in the creation of some of my favorite records. If you're as fascinated as I am by what goes into making music at the studio level, you are going to love this. We're going to cover a lot of territory here, so strap in. I spoke to David from his studio where he was working on his latest project. So let's let me begin with some biographical information. You are Canadian. You grew up here. Uh, let's go through all of that. Okay, so I was born in Dundas, Ontario, which is um, kind of a small town tacked on to the very west end of Hamilton. Uh, and I grew up a uh, pretty suburban lifestyle, a uh, very nice little town. Um, it was a tougher town when I was growing up, but it's now become a very nice little pretty twee town uh, in southern Ontario, little valley town, so it can only grow so big. Um, lots of retirees and lots of young families now. So how did you get out? Or, or what was the, the route out of Dundas for you? So... I was very interested in doing something with music. And my girlfriend at the time, uh, her uncle was Bob Lanois, who owned Grant Avenue Studios. It always comes back to the Lanois, doesn't it? If it's in Hamilton. (laughs) So uh, she said, why don't you go talk to my uncle about a job? And I uh, I was in college at the time at Mohawk, uh, not very happy with what was going on. Um, So... I, I went down and I talked to Bob and didn't know anything about recording, but I, I walked in the door of that studio and I looked to the left and there was that MCI console and all those lights and some music was going on in the other room. And I was like, man, I want something to do with this. So I walked upstairs and I talked to Bob and asked him for a job. And he said, no, but you can come and hang out and we'll see if we like you after a while. And then maybe there'll be a job. So I hung out and I did, uh, like odd jobs, kind of cutting grass, washing windows, anything you could do to make kind of money. And then at night I would go into the studio and I would learn about how to record and I would assist on sessions and clean toilets and make tea and all that stuff that young assistants do. And then about nine months later, uh, an opening came up for an assistant. So they gave me and another guy named Roman Zach a job and it all started from there. And then, you know, I sort of ingratiated myself with the Lanois and when Bob, uh, when Dan went over to work with Peter Gabriel, he said, I might need an assistant over there. Do you want to come over? And I said, yes, of course. Uh, and so I sort of bugged him for a while. And finally, he 
sent me a plane ticket and I, I went over and I went to England and sort of the rest carried on from there. So it, it was a cascading thing. So uh, Eno comes to Lanois, Lanois comes to you. Wow, that's a great path. I <laughs> I love to be to be named in the in, in the company of those two for sure. Yeah, uh, it was really interesting. Actually, my beginnings in in recording and and making music stemmed from those early ambient sessions. That was those were the first things that were going on when I was assisting there. So I wasn't kind of in a, in a pop studio environment or a. Um, there was a jingle house as well that worked out of the place, and I got a lot of experience doing those things. But uh, the sort of creativity that was going on in that studio at the time was unusual. And so it sort of formed my, my inner um, or my initial, I guess, approach to working on music because it was there were no rules. There was no, nothing that you had to have a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, you just made music that made you feel good. So... Uh, it, it formed my my the beginnings of how I thought about recording music. What what years are these? So this is probably 1983, 84. Okay, so it's after it's after Dan was doing all the indie bands like Cracker, and then after he was do, working with Martha and the Muffins. So his so career- there was some of the Martha and the Muffins stuff. Martha and the Muffins and the Parachute Club and uh, Luba. Uh, those records were going on while I was there. And then he went over to do the Unforgettable Fire and then came with you two and then came back. And then Peter called him, Gabriel, and went over to do Birdie and then came back. And Birdie kind of led into the So album. And that's when I came over and uh, assisted him there. So you worked on the So record? I was an assistant on that. I did some engineering um, and sort of helped out in, in places where they needed me. Uh, but Kevin Killen was the engineer on that record for sure. But still, you, you got to hear songs like In Your Eyes and Red Rain and Sledgehammer come together. Uh, absolutely. It was fascinating, fascinating process. So you end up in the UK for 20 years. Did this happen after you worked with Gabriel? Yes, I ended up staying on working for him. What was happening was uh, Dan was uh, slated to do the next Psychedelic Furs record. And uh, I went down with him to rehearse at John Giblin's rehearsal studio in Surrey, somewhere deep of Surrey. And they didn't really have any songs written. And Dan had just spent a year and a half with a, an artist who hadn't had any songs written and they wrote them as they went. And Dan was like, man, just call me when you've got some songs. So he didn't end up doing that record. And we came back, back to London where we were living at the time. And he said, well, I haven't got a gig here anymore. So I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to go back home. Uh, you can either come with me and I'll find you some work or you can go back to Grand Avenue or you can stay here and see what you, you can find. And I thought, you know, I'm here. I can always go home if it doesn't work out. But I thought, he said, there's another month in the flat that we were renting. He called it the Georgian Swank. It was a very swanky place in Marble Arch. So he said, there's another, another month here. Just stay and see what you can find. So I stayed in London, kind of worked around the studio, tried to find work around the studios. Ended up going back down to Bath, where the studio was with Peter. And there was lots of stuff that needed to be taken care of at, at what was the initial real world studios, which was basically a barn outside of outside of Bath in this little village called Upper Sleenswick. And there's tape storage to do, setting up Peter's keyboards, doing all kinds of things that really the studio manager that was there didn't want to do. And it then cascaded into, well, we're going to set up for the rehearsals for the tour. So can you come set up there? And so I would set up stuff there and I would have tapes ready for the musicians to learn parts because the record had been done over about a year and a half. So, you know, if they played something on it a year and ago, they, they would have forgotten. So it's like, okay, Here's, you know, here's the multi-track, here's what your part was, et cetera, et cetera. And I was also setting up Peter's keyboards and working with him. And then when the record started to blow up a little bit more, they started building, uh, booking bigger venues. And so the stage manager that also took care of Peter's equipment was unable to do both of those jobs. And they said, look, we got to bring Botchel out here because he knows your stuff. And I haven't got time to do this. So they had to race to get me visas and everything to the point where I actually had to come into Toronto and then take a bus across to, to Buffalo to where we were playing in Buffalo. <laughs> then my visa came through and I was all, all legal at that point. But uh, it sort of, just one thing led to another. And I essentially 
did my best to make myself indispensable. And if you do that, then they, people like to have you around. That's how this business works. You know, if you're there at the right time and you're, you've proven that you're willing to work, things will work out for you. I always say to, to young engineers and young, young producers, I say, look, opportunities present themselves every day. And all you have to do is say yes and recognize what those opportunities are and you'll be fine. Are you musical in any way? Do you play instruments or did you play instruments? I do. I do. I play. I, I don't play very well. I think my talent is, is better. And I say this a lot. It, it's my talent is helping great musicians play better or, or write better. My skill is not in how to play things. I can, I can hack things through, but I'm not a great player. So you're in London for 20 years. Yep. Uh, working with Gabriel and a variety of other people, I suppose. Yeah. What studios did you work in there? So I did most of my work for the first 11 years at Real World Studios. I helped sort of build that place in the mill building in Box. And when I left and I moved up to London, then I was working at um, a number. I did some Eden. I did some at Townhouse, some at Trident Studios. Um, oh, with, with, with that wonderful piano. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I worked a little bit um, at... Uh, what was it called in Shoreditch where Jamie Reed, uh, the artist that did the Sex Pistols stuff, he designed the whole thing. And I can never, for some reason, remember the studio's name. It was a great place. And I was living in Bethnal Green at the time, which was down the road from it. When did you move to New York? Uh, so after that, when I was in Bethnal Green and I went to do work on some projects in New York City uh, with Universal Republic, when I was in, in high school, I was always fascinated with New York City, and I'd always wanted to live there. And so when I, uh, when I was doing some projects there, I just thought, what the heck? Why not move here for a while? I was, I was doing well enough at the time that I had a house in London and I could keep it, and I just got this apartment in the West Village. It's where I'd always wanted to be. It was fantastic, and I was working there at uh, Soundtrack Studios, which is up uh, just, just north of um, Union Square, and I was living the dream. It was fantastic. I had an amazing apartment, and I was only really there for about a year and a half, and I met my now ex-wife, who uh, is from Toronto, and... Uh, so I sort of commuted back and forth from New York to Toronto and then ended up just moving back to Toronto. When did you make Toronto your permanent home? 2005, 2006. Sort of 2006, really. So here's a question I get all the time and I realize that there is no pat answer. I'm just going to ask for your opinion of it. As far as you're concerned, what does a record producer do? It's a really hard question, that one, but I think... I think the responsibility of the record producer is to get the best out of the artist, the musician, and the songs that you possibly can. And there are a number of techniques that you can do to achieve that. Some producers are very autocratic. They come in, it's like, here's what you have to do. This is the way the songs are going to go. Follow my lead, and that's it. That sounds like Todd Rundgren. <laughs> yeah, there, there are a lot of people that do that, and Bob Ezrin's like that, you know? And But he's really, like... People get great results by doing that. It's just not in my personality. I'm a collaborative producer, so I like to work with the artist. What have you got? Okay, how about this suggestion? What if you tried this? What if you tried this? And I like to work with people and feed off of people because I don't think I have the best ideas all the time. All I ask of the artists that I'm working with is that when we're working is there either with a solo artist or a band is that all the ideas that come up get a shot. So you say, okay, Let's try this. Don't put it down. Don't argue about it. Because at the end of the day, if you just wanted to, if you, you can argue for, for as long as you want, or you can just try the idea and you'll know within just a couple of minutes, like, oh yeah, that works. Oh no, that doesn't work. I like to work with people and build on the foundations that we both come with to the table. But that's something that you can only really do in a proper recording studio, isn't it? When you have time and all the gear that you may need. Yes and no. I like to get involved in pre-production first. And a lot of that collaborative writing work happens during that time. So you're then in a situation where you're not in an expensive studio. You're in a rehearsal room, which is a couple hundred bucks a day. Or you're in, maybe somebody's got a place in their house. I've got a studio in my place. So you're, you, you can go to a place where it's not so expensive, run through all those ideas, and then put stuff down in, in the proper recording studio. We have to talk about your work with Tool. This is one of the things that you're most famous for. How is it working with a band that 
you know, Adam Jones is one of the great guitar players. And I don't know what's going on in his, in his head when it comes to arrangements. And I don't know what Maynard's thinking when he's coming up with his lyrics. I mean, writing a song in a Fibonacci sequence. I mean, uh, how how is it working with a band that works so meticulously and so slow? Well, I kind of got used to working slow with Peter Gabriel. He doesn't work very fast. But Adam, I think, is one of our generation's greatest guitarists. And he doesn't get a lot of love because he's not a shredder as such. But I think the, the thing that I love about Adam is his attention to the detail of the tone of his guitar. Like, for example, he'll go through, when he has his guitar tech replace the, the volume pots in his guitar, he'll go through 10 of them before it'll feel just the right way that he likes it to feel. Well, for, he, for, turn, for turning it up and down? Turning the volume up and down because he uses the volume knob on the guitar for instead of just like turning the amp down, he'll just turn the guitar down. So that's why you get that sort of slightly hollowish sound from when he, because he, he's just turning the volume of the guitar down a little bit to give a little bit and then, then winding it back up for the heavier parts. And the way that he plays his guitar, the way he hits the string, the angle at which he plays, the position that he does, that's his skill. And the, the tone that he gets is very precise. And we would work on something and overdub something that, that he was working on his guitar and, and he would be playing it just right. But he's like, no, I didn't get the right tone by the way I hit the pick. Let me do it again. He's very meticulous that way. And when they write, they write as a, as, as a three-piece group. Maynard doesn't sit in with them because it's too frustrating for him to keep going. Because what happened, at least when I was working with them, is they would practice through a song and work through a whole piece. And then Adam would take it home on the weekend and re-edit it up, cut it up, the structure of it, and, and try and say, okay, now we're going to play it like this. How does this feel? And do that over and over and over again until he got just the right feel from every section that he, that he had. And, you know, there were only a couple songs on the Lateralis album that were that were unfinished when I got there and, and I helped to sort of say, well, I think you should take this section out and, or that section to, and, you know, work with them that way because Adam is so meticulous about it. He knows exactly once he's, he has to explore every option, but once he has, he's pretty confident about the way that, uh, he, what he's come up with in the end. I, I find it amazing uh, when you run into musicians that are that patient because they're willing to wait until the, it, it's just right. And it's, they won't be rushed. Uh, yeah. They have to, the music's got to feel right to them. I, I really respect that. And I, I think that there's not many artists that can really do that anymore. We're in a different world now where you, you don't get that luxury. Um, Tool have carved themselves out a niche within the music industry that no one else really exists in. And so they're able to do this and they're able to have a career doing that. I think a young band trying to do that starting out now would have a bit of a harder time. Tool from Lateralis, 2001, produced by David Bottrell. Around the same time, David was asked to help out with a new band called Muse. And that story is next. This is another Studio Stories episode, which gives us a chance to explore how records are made by the people who make them. And this time, it's Canadian producer David Bottrell, famous for the Tool records that he's worked on. We'll get back to them in a bit, but also for albums by such people as Muse. Let's talk about Muse. You got to them fairly early in their career, around 2001. For the, uh, second, album, second album, the Origin to Symmetry. Origin to Symmetry album. So uh, how old were they? They must have been... Barely in their 20s. They were kids, yeah. They were very young kids. They'd come off the success, the moderate success of their first record, and they were out on tour. And so we went into the st uh, studio out in Surrey, and basically they were in the middle of a tour, and we were going to get do this recording while they were there. And they were basically on mushrooms the entire time <laughs> that they were there. And I actually saw them not, not too long ago when they played Toronto and, and we laughed about it, you know, and my, my job on that record was basically corralling Matt for all of his ideas and, and actually getting something down on tape because they were, he was so full of ideas and, and things. He'd be in the middle of a guitar overdub halfway through the song go, Oh wait, I've got this keyboard thing. Hang on. And he'd go over to a Rhodes and start playing that. And I'd be like, okay, Let's put a little snippet of that down. Now, let's go finish the guitar, and then we'll go back to that. Because <laughs> he just couldn't, it was just flowing out of him. He was, he's quite an inspiring character. He's, he's got so many ideas. I had sushi with him once when they were in Toronto, the whole band. And we went to a place on Adelaide called Naomi. Mm -hmm. 
And we sat in the middle of the room and no one knew who they were. They hadn't broken into North America at that point. So I turned to Matt and I say, hey, must be kind of nice to be able to go out in public without, you know, having people fawn all over you all the time. And he was very disturbed. He looked at me and he said, no, this just means we have to try harder. Yeah. I saw them at the Monarch in London, which was a little tiny gig uh, the, the, where it used to be um, uh, just below Kentish Town. Small gig. And they were playing like it was Wembley Stadium. And, and I, I saw them. This is when I was just going to go work with them. And I, I, I went up to him and I said, yeah, that's a pretty big production for a small place. He said, we always saw it. Like, if we want to make it to Wembley, we got to play every gig like it's Wembley. And so they, they, he's always had that ambition. Muse with Plug In Baby from their Origins of Symmetry album. There were several producers on that record, including this episode's guest, David Bottrell. Let's move on to another project. Another band that you worked with was uh, Silverchair. And you worked with them when they were deeper into their career. Uh, this is the Diorama album in 2002. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it about them that you think earned them such undying devotion from their fan base? Was it because they started so young? Um, I think probably that's part of it in that they, they started young, their fans were young, and their fans grew with them. But I think Daniel's always given his fans something new on every project that he's ever done so, to, to good and ill. Some, some people stick with him and the ones that stick with him love what he does and love his diversity. The ones that just want frog stomp over and over again, they probably left. But, you know, if you, if you listen to frog stomp and I'm not dissing that record for 14 year old kids, it's pretty amazing, but it's a fairly derivative record, that grunge genre thing. And that's what you're listening to when you're 14, 15 years old and thrashing guitars. But Daniel is such an incredibly talented writer, sorry, and musician, that he didn't want to keep making the same record over and over again. He wanted to explore lots of new things. And, you know, from a psychological standpoint, we all know what it's like for a, a young person to be very, very famous. You know, he said, he said to me at one point, it's like, well, picture yourself at 14 years old and you're riding your bike to high school or to school one day. And then the next day you're riding your bike to school and there are 20 paparazzi vans behind you with cameras. You know, think of that and think about why he said that, you know, his whole eating sort of thing, he, he just thought if he stopped eating, maybe people would just leave him alone. Yeah. So he had the anorexia problem and he also had the arthritis issue. Yeah. After the diorama record, he'd been eating, but he was only eating fruit. That's the only thing he would get a fruit plate every day and just eat fruit. So he got this reactive arthritis thing. That's why they couldn't really tour the record right away. And I think maybe why, you know, the Atlantic just decided to kind of soft release it, if you will. Silverchair and the David Bottrell produced Diorama album from 2001. He was actually brought in to replace another producer because the band was looking for someone to help take them in a different direction. So let's follow up with that. So are you a hands-on guy working with Pro Tools and mic placement and outboard gear, or do you let the engineer handle that sort of stuff? Depends on the situation. If if I'm like the, the record that I'm doing at the moment, which and I went down to Atlanta and they have their studio and their engineer there. So plugging myself into that situation, you know, I would go out and have suggestions on those. But the engineer was a very good engineer named Tom Tapley. And he knew how to mic up a guitar cabinet and a drum kit. And he, he said, what do you got in mind? And I would do this and I would work with him. So, yes, I'm hands on in that way. I can use Pro Tools. I do it all the time. He's sitting there doing it already. Why do I need to go over and do that? He's a great operator, great engineer. So I will, I will be able to then sit back and I can just think about performance. I, I've sat with Steve Lillywhite in the studio and he wants his own Pro Tools guy. And he, his, his whole thing is about coaching and suggesting and cheering on the performances. He just lets somebody else take care of all the gear. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of leaning more and more to that these days. I used to be all about the gear and doing like having my hands on you know, on everything. As I get older, I find you know there are other people that are probably quicker than me at Pro Tools. You know, there's a guy in Toronto here at Union Sound, Darren, who who Darren McGill, he, who runs the Pro Tools there, and he's so quick. It's like I I can't be that fast. Not and think about 
the performance and think about if I'm doing vocals with somebody, sure. I can sit down and go and I can hit play and record and go, yeah, okay. And still take my notes and do that. That's not, not as much of And it's often that works quicker than using an engineer because you're right there. You're like, bang, 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 go. But uh, you know, when it's band tracks or other things going on, I'm often to the point of like, you operate that and I'm going to work with the musician. I'm going to coach him. So do you help with songwriting and arrangement or is it just sort of sitting back saying, let's try things? Yes, no, yes, no. No, I will. It depends on what the artist needs. If they're, if they're, if they've got all the arrangements and all the, all the sort of structures down and all I do is rearrange things, that's one approach. Uh, if they're unhappy with something, I will suggest like, okay, what if instead of going to the G flat there, you're going to the A sharp or you go to the, something else, uh, you know, go somewhere else and and find another chord to lead in there. I, I, I work really well in transitions. So often songwriters write in blocks. They'll say, okay, well, this is what my verse is. And here's what the verse, you play the verse. Okay, that's good. Okay, well, here's what my bridge is like. or Here's what my chorus is like. Okay, that's good. Butting them together. Yeah, you can do that. But if you have a little transition moment that gets you there, what if you went to this chord and that chord and then you got the chorus payoff? That that might lead you better into that. I've learned over the years to recognize where those things are necessary. In a moment, more from producer David Bottrell, including another couple of tool studio stories. We're with David Bottrell talking about studio stories. Here's a good one involving tool. Do you have any studio stories that stick out? I mean, you've told us a bunch already about Muse and tool and a few others. Is there any moment <laughs> that just you'll never forget in a studio environment? But the, the, the sort of emotional one was really, it was really hard that there was a time um, when we were recording Lateralis, uh, we went into the studio and Maynard had written the words to one of the songs and Adam hadn't heard any of the words properly yet. They'd been doing some in rehearsal. Anyway, it turns out it was a quite, so Adam, Adam and, and Maynard were, were very close at one point, and there was a long time period between the, the Anima and the Lateralis record where their relationship had soured a little bit due to a lot of legal problems that they'd gone through firing their manager, record company, the whole nine yards. Some of the lyrics in that song that we went to record, the first one we went to record, was there were some challenging lyrics for Adam to hear. And they spent the next day, we did one take through the song, and then they spent the next day and a half in the lounge talking it out. And it was almost the end of Tool at that point. It was almost the end of that band. Uh, it didn't, they worked out their problems. Maynard changed a couple of the lyrics and uh, the song became something else. But uh, yeah, sort of waiting and hoping that this wasn't the end of what I thought was a great band. And then coming up with that album Lateralis at the end of it was something I won't forget. Well, there's, there's got to be some conflict during the sessions, during the songwriting for the emotion to be stirred up so that you can capture a great record. Isn't that true? Yes. You need that rub, that conflict, the, the, the classic, the Lennon-McCartney battle between you know, whichever the, whatever the battle is between to have that tension. The records that are easy often aren't that, aren't that good, but um, yeah, there's, there, there are a few, a few moments on this one that I'm doing right now that were, that were interesting. I, I can't tell those stories just yet though. How many of the records you've worked on do you listen to again? Once I'm done with most of them, it's not that often. Every now and again, I'll, I'll put something on, but it's, it's a rarity. That seems to be a thing with a lot of producers. So, you know, Lily White again. Uh, I asked him, how often do you listen to you know the first U2 album or a second Luck First album or something something else you've done? And he goes, never, because I always hear things I would rather have done. Well, that's what I do too. Exactly. I hear the flaws. And so you listen to something, you're just like, you'll hear something like, oh. Like there's a, you know, there, there are moments in, in one of the Tool songs, 46 and 2, at the end of that song where the bass like it's got this offbeat bass, but because the way the distortion was hitting it, 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 it kind of hit in the wrong place in a couple spots and it, it always drives me crazy. When I listen back to work that I've done in the past, I, I see the warts and that, that drives me nuts. So it's like, uh, other people like it. I'll take their word for it. 
Uh, you have been quoted as saying, I prefer to work on music that has a strong identity and shows elements of originality. Genre really isn't important. Can you elaborate on that a bit? I'd like to think that my catalog of work is not so genre specific. Um, in America, North America, I'm known as the tool guy or the guy who does heavy music. But if you look back in my catalog, there are things that are nothing like heavy music. And I've done a lot of world music. I've done other bands that, that are softer. There's a, a Scottish country artist that I work with. Right now I'm working with El Cien, Montreal atmospheric singer. So I don't really care what the style of the music is. I look for the integrity in the writing and the conviction of, of the message that they're writing. And that, for me, feels like it's something I can feed upon or I can grab onto to work with. Genre really isn't isn't that important to me. I've, I've not done a whole lot of country stuff, but I don't see why I couldn't because for me, it's, it's, it's all about the writing, and the performance. And if it's a great song, it's a great song. One of the people that I think really should have been more well-known in North America is uh, Nazrat Fateh Ali Khan, mm -hmm. uh, the Pakistani quality singer. I guess you got hooked up with him through Peter Gabriel? Yeah, so at Real World, uh, we used him on the Passion soundtrack, uh, and then he did a, a number of records with Michael Brook, who's also a Torontonian originally, uh, and we made those records with him, uh, with Michael producing, and I was engineering them. I think that, you know, the, the passion that he sings with is undeniable. I think it's hard because he's not singing in English, and people... Don't don't quite get it. Uh, you know, if you just it, like I do, I do get people coming up to me and saying, you know, that musically that that they love it. And there's there's things about it that they, they feel transcendent about. But, you know, it's it's not pop music. It's not something that that the casual listener can can really enjoy. I think it, it's hard with all those styles of music, unless you're unless you're kind of introduced to it young, like I was. It's hard to really. Yeah, it's, it's hard to really get into. There's there's one song of his called Must Must. The Must mm -hmm. that I, I I think is just brilliant, and I've 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 had that on a thousand different playlists. Yeah, M Massive Attack did that remix of Must Must. Oh, they did. Yeah, yeah, Massive Attack did, did a remix of that. So you, that might be the one you're listening to. I'm not sure. We did one for the record, and then they did a remix of it. Yeah, that's pro that's probably the one you're listening to. Here are a few more questions for David Bottrell. Big professional studios are having a really hard time keeping the lights on these days because they're so hard to maintain. Record label budgets have shrunk. Um, people are locked up with COVID and other things. What's the future for the professional recording studio? I think professional recording studios will probably have to diversify a little bit and Maybe their, uh, maybe their spaces, if they're large, are, will be possibly used as event spaces as well. It's frustrating to me because I don't see certainly the major labels really suffering at the moment. They're, they're doing quite well out of streaming and they're doing quite well. Uh, it's always the, the sort of down the river that, that gets squeezed. And it seems like you know, some labels are, are using the current state of the industry as a bit of an excuse when I don't see them doing particularly badly at the moment. So it's a bit rum for me at the moment that they're squeezing recording studios. Um, I think some here in Canada are not doing that quite so much. I'm having good relationships with a lot of them here and they're, they're paying fair prices for things because they are doing okay. But uh, in other countries, I'm finding that, that yeah, they're, they're utilizing the excuse of a lot of these things to, to squeeze people. And I think at the end of the day, you'll end up with less great studios out there. And that's a real tragedy. Finally, uh, what is Make Music Matter? Make Music Matter is a, an organization that uses the um, writing and composition of music as a therapeutic tool to heal trauma in marginalized communities and individuals. So what that means is... Um, our organization goes to uh, war-torn areas such as the Democratic Republic of Congo or northern Manitoba into the indigenous communities up there in Fox Lake Cree Nation, and we set up small recording studios. And we use those studios as, as sort of a group therapy and recording session. So, for example, in the DRC, we're at this hospital called Pansy Hospital, 
which was set up by Nobel laureate Dr. Dennis McQuaige for the reconstructive surgery for women that had suffered gender-based violence as a result of the conflict there. So they'll go through their surgery and then as in groups, they'll come into the studio and they'll start writing songs about their experiences. There's a music producer there that helps write the tracks. There's a therapist there in every studio that we have and they work together as a group therapy and they tell their stories and the therapist, we sort of sneak the therapy in under the radar. They think they're coming to a recording session and a songwriting session and we sneak in the therapy underneath and it's, we've got metrics and studies that show that this is the best, you, best way to heal the trauma of, of any kind, really, that, that through this therapy, they end up telling their stories. And in the, in the case of the, the women in the DRC, they become advocates for their situation. So we, we bring them back here. I have a team of, of volunteer mixers that mix the songs. We release them through Warner Music Canada. We release them, we send them back to the artists themselves. So we treat them as proper artists. We have a, a label and a publishing company called A4A, Music Publishing and A4A Records. And we treat all these people who write the music for us as proper artists. They get signed. They get, uh, we struck a deal with SoCan so that they can get their, their um, performance royalties. And we disseminate. Now, there's never very much money that comes from the sales of these. But the fact that we're treating them as proper artists also helps to, to the, for the retention of the healing of the trauma. And so these women come out of it uh, in the DRC and these kids up in Fox Lake or we, we were in a uh, multitude of countries in Guinea, we're in South Africa. It, it basically is a, is a way to, you know, and in the situation of where people are going through trauma today for all different kinds of reasons, that they, uh, they're able to heal from that and, and move on with their lives. Last question. Where do you keep your Grammy Awards? <laughs> you know... They're up at my cottage. <laughs> I have a cottage. I, I, don't, I don't put them up in places. I don't like to see them, but my family does. So they, uh, it's, it's up at the family cottage. Thanks to David Bottrell for taking the time to tell us how things work as a Grammy award-winning record producer. And now that you know what sorts of things can go into making a song and an album, maybe you'll listen with more of a critical ear, looking for those things that make a recording special. Podcasts of these programs are available through all the podcast delivery platforms. If you can name one, we're there. Just download any of the hundreds of programs and go. If you need music news and information on a daily basis, I've got my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. Get the free newsletter so you don't miss anything. We can always connect through Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you have any questions, any questions at all about this program, just drop an email to alan at alancross.ca and I'll get right back to you. Technical production for all this is by Rob Johnston. We'll talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Before we leave today's Ongoing History of New Music podcast, uh, I want you to know that we're part of a network called Curious Cast. And Curious Cast has a lot of podcasts available on its network. And one of the new ones is called Art Cotex. And I have two of the hosts of Art Cotex with me here. Uh, we have Taj Krishlo and Director X. And we want to give you a bit of a, an introduction to what this new podcast is all about. So, who wants to go first? and explain exactly what you guys will be doing. And obviously, here's a hint, if you're at the end of this podcast, my podcast, Chance Start has something to do with music. So our show is pretty much about, it's in the world of music, it's pretty much us sitting down with uh, storytellers that come from music videos. Uh, I feel like we live in a world where we don't give these, these amazing creative uh, artists uh, the flowers they deserve. They create some of the most uh, impactful uh, content on the planet that gets a lot of eyeballs on it. And coming from the world of music video, being in the business for over 20 years, we felt it was necessary to create a show like Architects to sit down and hear their stories, their come ups, their journey, their process of creating some of the most iconic music videos, films, and content on the planet. Now, you guys have been deeply involved in this world for, like you say, a long time. Who have you worked with? I've directed videos for Alicia Keys, Puff Daddy, Cisco, uh, uh, Destiny's Child, Drake, Justin Bieber, Two Chains, 
Rosalia, Iggy Azalea, Sean Paul, Beanie Man, um, Ariana Grande. Uh, well, you know. Okay, uh, now, now now you're just bragging. Corn, <laughs> <laughs> John Mayer, the list goes on. Like we, this has literally been. Um, a crazy journey. And, and I would say X is the goat because as long as he's been doing it, like, like late nineties to now is still relevant. Our, you know, like we broke our, our production company fella with uh, this music video for, uh, for DJ Khaled, Drake and Bieber called pop star. So it's, it's, it's been a crazy journey. And um, there were two kids from Brampton, Ontario that uh, went out to, you know, make art that broke out to the world. And, now we're using our podcast as another form of storytelling, but through an audio uh, medium. Okay. How are you going to make that transition? You've been telling stories through video. Now it's going to be only audio. So uh, you're going to have to change your style a little bit, I guess. I mean, we're talking to the creator, so it's a different kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, the, the story is the story of the maker. So it's not conceptualizing music and visuals to it. It's talking like the last, the first podcast, the debut of our, of the show was with Dave Myers. Um, another guy that's been in the game for a long, long time. And just talking about that, the philosophy behind his approach to art, the work he's done. And, you know, as well, digging into some of the larger world issues out there. Like we have a whole talk about black lives matter. Uh, on that podcast and being a white director and his perspective coming up in a black music uh, world. So it's just a, it's a little different than what we're used to doing. Without any spoilers, give me the kind of stories that you'll be telling. Give me an example of a story. I guess the examples is pretty much their come up. Um, what they, what gravity, what, what drew them in to get into this world of uh, filmmaking, um, their influences, um, their highs, their lows, and pretty much their breakthrough moment. And and a lot of times, to your point, um, Alan, like when you watch a music video, you're just seeing the end result, but you don't see what what it went into to make that product and and that that piece of art. As far as the storyboards and the the art direction and sitting down with your head department and the collaboration. So it's pretty much we're 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 giving them that kind of you know, close set behind experience where you get to see the process of how uh, we get to the finish line. Right. I've, I've always, I've often watched music videos and wondered where the hell did this come from? What kind of <laughs> headspace do you have to be in to come up with these images, these storylines, these, you know, things. Uh, and, and I have no idea. Yeah, it's it's and that's the point of the show. Like, look, we're probably like around the same age. Like I came up I came up in the 80s era where that's what made me fall in love with music videos. Right. The MTV much music era watching videos by like Madonna and Peter Gabriel and like Phil Collins and, and Michael Jackson and uh, uh, and Aerosmith. And I was always fascinated by music videos and the storytelling and the dancing and the style and all that stuff. And that's what got, that's what made us fall in love with the art. So imagine if you could go back in the days and sit down with Duran Duran and talk about the Hungry Like a Wolf video. Like, what the hell compelled you guys to be in this jungle and, and, and just going through this crazy, crazy story and sitting down with like the best of the best and hearing their, the stories of the directors working with Madonna and working with the Stones. And that's the beauty about the show. It's like we get that access to these filmmakers, to these artists. I've worked with the biggest and brightest artists in the entertainment business, but learn about that journey, that creative journey, that collaboration to make the work that we see that's now on television or on YouTube. And, and before we jump, I just want to say, please follow us at Architects Pods. Uh, I can't wait for this. Sounds like a great series. Looking forward to it. It's called Art Cotex with Karina Evans, Tash Critchlow, and Director X. And uh, I can't wait to hear some of these stories. Thank you so much, you guys. All right.